When Janie Mary turned the corner into Nicholas Street that morning, she leaned wearily against the shop front to rest. Her small head was bowed, and the hair, which was so nondescript and unclean, covered her face. Her small hands gripped one another for warmth across the faded bodice of her frock. Around the corner lay canning cottages, with their tiny, frost-gleaming gardens and gates that were noisy and freezing to touch. She had tried each of them in turn. Her timid knock was well known to the people who lived in canning cottages. That morning, some of them had said, it's that little Carthy one, never mind open it. Twice in the last week she's been around, it's too much of a good thing. Those who did answer had been door. They poked cross and harassed faces around half-open doors. Tell her mammy, they said, it's at school she should have her, and not out worrying poor people the likes of them. They had the mouths of their own to feed and the bellies of their own to fill, and God knows that took some doing. The school was in Nicholas Street, and children with satchels were already passing. Occasionally, Janie Mary could see a few paper books peeping from an open flap, and beside them, a child's lunch and a bottle of milk. In the schoolroom was a scrawled and incomprehensible blackboard with rows of staring faces which sniggered when Janie Mary was stupid in her answers. Sometimes Father Benedict would visit the school. He asked questions in catechism and gave the children sweets. He was a huge man who had more intuition than intellect, more genuine affection for children than for learning. One day he found Janie Mary sitting by herself in the back desk. She felt him giant-like above her, bending over her. Some wrapped sweets were put on the desk. And what's your name, little girl? Janie Mary Carthy, father. I'm Father Benedict of the Augustinians. Where do you live? Father Benedict had pushed his way and shoved his way until he was sitting in the desk beside her. Quite suddenly, Janie Mary had felt safe and warm. She said easily, I live in canning cottages. He talked to her while the teacher continued self-consciously with her lesson. So your daddy works in the meat factory? No, Father, my daddy's dead. Father Benedict nodded and patted her shoulder. You and I must be better friends, Janie, he said. We must tell your mammy to send you to school more often. Yes, Father. Because we must see more of each other, mustn't we? Yes, Father. Would you always come to school? I'd like to come, Father. Father Benedict had talked with her for some time like that. The pair of them crushed clumsily in the, da in the desk and their heads close together. When he was leaving, he gave her more sweets. Later, the teacher took them from her as a punishment and gave them out again as prizes for neatness. She thought of Father Benedict until an old beggar who was passing said to her, Are you whinging, child? Is there anything up at you? She lifted her head and looked stupidly at him, her mouth open and her eyes quite dry. He was a humpbacked man with broken boots and a bulbous nose. The street about him was a moving forest of feet, the stolid tread of workmen and the pious shuffle of middle-aged women on their way from Mass. You look a bit chook, he said. Are you after taking a turn? No, mister, she said, wondering. I'm only going for to look for bread at St. Nicholas's. My mammy told me to. Your mammy left it a bit late then. They'll be going in to pray. As though awakened by his words, the bell of the Augustinian friary rang three times. It rang out with long, resounding strokes across the quivering street, and people paused to uncover their heads and to bless themselves. Janie Mary looked up quickly. The steeple of the church rose clear and gleaming above the tall houses, and the golden slimness of its cross raced swiftly against the blue and gold of the sky. Her mother had said, Look till you find me, lady, and you won't lose your labour. This is the day of the blessed bread, and if you get it nowhere else, they'll be giving it out in St. Nicholas's. She turned suddenly and ran quickly up the length of the street. But when she reached the priory, the doors were closed and the waiting queue had broken into small knots. She stopped uncertainly and stared for some time. The priests, the people had said, are gone in to pray. They would be back in an hour. She was glad to turn homewards. She was tired now and her bare feet moved reluctantly on the ice cold pavement. Johnny might have been given some bread on his round with the sticks and her mother might have had some hidden away. Her mother sometimes did that so that Janie Mary would try very hard to get some. Picking her way amongst the debris littered wasteland 
upon which houses had once stood, she watched her shadow bobbing and growing with the uneven rippling of the ground. The light of the wintry sun rested wanly on everything, and the sky was dizzily blue and fluffed a little with white cloud. They were rust-eaten tin cans lying neglected on the waste, and the fragments of colored delf which she could have gathered to play Cheney's had she had the time. The children often went there to play shop. They marked out their pitches with a file of pebbles in the form of an open square. When Janie Mary stood in one of the squares for a moment, she was no longer Janie Mary. The wasteland became a busy street and the tracery of pebbles glittering stores. Her face would grow grave. It was that serene gravity of a child at play. But when she stepped out of the magic square, she was again Janie Mary. A Janie Mary who was cold and hungry and whose mother was waiting impatiently for bread that had not been found. There was none, she said, looking up at her mother's face. Nobody would give it, and the man said the priests wouldn't be back for an hour. She looked around hopefully as she spoke, but there were only a few crumbs on the table. They littered its grease-fouled and flower-patterned covering. An enamel jug stood in the centre and about it the slopped ugliness of used cups. Now that she was home, she realised how endless the morning's trudging had been, she realised how every door had been closed against her. Her mother's voice rose. Then you can go without. Are you after looking at all, you little trollop? Two hours to go the length of the street and around to the holy priests and all of us in awakeness with the hunger and Johnny going out with the sticks and him famished as just for the little bit of bread that I had left away. Are you after looking at all? The enamel of the jug was broken in three places. The brakes were spidery like the blobs of ink which used to fall so dishearteningly onto our copybooks. Down the side of each cup clung the yellow residue of dribbled tea. The whole table shifted suddenly and went back again, and her mother's voice seemed far away. Janie Mary needed to sit down. Gallivanting, her mother said. Off gallivanting with your pals. I'll gallivant you, but you can go back again. There's nothing in the house. Back with you to the priest's house and wait like any Christian for what's going. And take that bag with you. You won't do a hand's turn till you do that. Janie Mary stood with her hands clasped in front of her and looked up at her mother. The thought of going back again filled her with misery. I asked, she said. I asked everywhere. Then you can ask again, said the mother. You can ask till you find, and swung away. Janie Mary went wearily to the corner to fetch the bag. The kitchen trembled and became dark when she bent to pick it up. As she went out of the door, her mother said, Put a bit of hurry on yourself there and don't be slinging. It's certain you'll ever die with the beating of your heart. The world and its wife would get something and mine would be left. Once more she was out in the ancient crookedness of streets, picking her way amidst the trundling of wheels and the countless feet. Tiny and lost beneath the steepness of houses, she went slowly, her bare feet dragging and dirty. At this hour, the shops in Nicholas Street were crowded with women who haggled over half pennies. White-coated assistants leaned quickly over marble-topped counters with heads cocked to one side and pencils raised in readiness or dashed from counters to shelves and back again, banging things on the scales and then licking pencil stubs while they frowned over figures. Sometimes Janie Mary used to stand and watch them, but now she went by without interest. When a tram went grinding past her, her lips trembled, and though the rails after it and before it gleamed in the sunlight, it was a pale, cold gleaming. There was no friendly heat in the sunlight. There was nothing friendly. There were only trundling trams and tramp of feet, and once again the slim cross on the spire of St. Nicholas's. On the Feast of the Blessed Bread, it was the custom of the priests to erect a wooden counter on the high steps before the door of the priory. Here, two of the brothers stood to watch the forming of the queue. Janie Mary looked hard through the veil which blurred occasionally in front of her eyes, but could catch no sign of Father Benedict. No bread had yet appeared, though the queue was growing. She took her place and kept close in by the wall. In near the wall, she found it easier to hold her position. It was very cold at first, but after a while more people came and the air grew warmer. They came, as she had known they would, with baskets and shawls, with torn shopping bags and ragged coats, and gathered thickly about her. There were men there too, old pensioners and men who had not worked for years. 
There won't be much going, they said. There was a shocking crowd here this morning. Take your bloody hand now, they said. Who do you think you're pushing? Now, come on, easy now, easy. Mind the chiseler. They talked like that for a long time. At first, they argued furiously with one another, but later they became dour with impatience. They shuffled uncomfortably. They spat frequently and heaved long sighs. After a while, it became frightening to be in there so close to the wall, to be so small that everyone towered over you. J.D. Mary felt weak and wanted to get out. When she glanced sideways or ahead of her, she could see nothing but tightly packed bodies. And when she looked down, there were feet, but no ground. She tried to look upwards, but couldn't. An hour passed before Benedict appeared on the steps. Father Benedict, God bless him, they said. It'll be coming soon when he's here. Janie Mary was lifted off the ground by the movement of the crowd and lost her place. Now she was behind a stoop-backed man with a threadbare coat and heavily nailed boots. His collar was flaked and greasy with dandruff and his coat was foul-smelling, but it was the boots which held Janie Mary's attention. They clattered unsteadily on the pavement very close to her bare feet. There were diamond-shaped nails and double rings about the heels of them. She bent to keep her eyes fixed on the boots and wriggled to avoid them. Her attention became fixed on them. To a man near her, she said, I want to get out, mister, help me get out. But even if he'd heard her, he couldn't have helped her now. She tried to attract attention, but they'd forgotten her. It's coming, they said, pressing forward. It's coming. And for a while, the murmuring changed and the queue surged. Look, they shouted, it's here. Janie Mary was lifted once more. Once more her feet were clear of the ground and her breathing stifled by the pressure of those around her. She was in danger now. And Claude, whimpering at the dandruff-flaked collar, through a whirl of arms and shoulders, she had a view of Father Benedict, his broad shoulders tall and firm above the press of bodies. She tried to call out to him, The chiseler! Someone said, noticing, For God's sake, quit pushing, look out for the chiseler! A man threw out his hand to grip her, but a movement of the crowd twisted him suddenly aside. She saw his hand grabbing futilely to her left. As the crowd parted, she began to slip. Father Benedict, she called faintly, Father Benedict. Then the man in front stumbled, and the nailed boots crushed down heavily on her feet. When her eyes opened again, she was on the sofa of the visitor's parlour. Father Benedict and one of the lay brothers were bending over her. Someone had put a rug about her. An electric fire glowed warmly against the opposite wall, and over it hung a gold-framed picture of the Sacred Heart. Her feet felt numb and heavy, and the picture swam before her eyes. But it was warm in the parlour, and the morning searching was over. Then suddenly she remembered the bread and her mother's words. She moved suddenly, but when she tried to speak, her ears were filled with noise. The lay brother had turned to Father Benedict. You were very quick, Father, he was saying. Is she badly hurt? Father Benedict, answering him, said in a strange voice, only her feet. You can see the print of the nails. <laughs>